Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's Board of Education meeting being held at the Town Hall Chambers. Today's date is Tuesday, March 10th, 2020. I appreciate if all cell phones and other electronic devices are turned off as this meeting is being recorded. Ellen, would you please do roll call? Thank you, Mr. Carey. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Cassio? Present. Mrs. Evans? Here. Mrs. Granado? Present. Mr. Lesser? Here. Mr. Michaels? Here. Mrs. Paradise? Mr. Riley? Here. Vice Person, excuse me, Vice Chairperson, Mr. Healy? I'll be a Vice Person. <laughs> Here. And um, Chairperson, Mr. Carey? Present. And Weathersfield High School Student Representative, Mr. Isaac Santos? Here. All present. Thank you. Now for the Pledge of Allegiance. Would the elementary school principals please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? There is no student staff recognitions tonight. We'll move on to approval of the previous board meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the February 25th, 2020 regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting minutes? So moved. Do Second. I have any discussions, comments, or questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. Moving on to public comment, anyone wishing to make a comment, please come up to the podium, state your name and address. Hi, I'm Kim Miller. Um, you need my address, right? 49 Old Post Road. Um, I just wanted to say that I support uh, Michael Emmett's budget. Um, we can't have any more cuts. I sat through all these meetings last year with you guys and was, you know, fighting tooth and tail for every single thing and had to provide school supplies for my kids this year. Um, I don't know where else we can cut, so I just, I want to say that I'm here to support him and the current budget, and I don't think that it can be cut any further. Sarah Smith, 60 Blueberry Hill. Um, I echo Kim's comment. I'm fully in support of Mr. Emmett's budget. I don't think there's any more room. I don't think... We can do much more, and if we want to preserve the integrity of our town and our kids, school is really where it starts. So I'm in full support of his budget. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Melissa Sutton, 8 Deer Ledge Lane. Um, I'm also in support of Mr. Emmett's budget. I think because Mr. Emmett is looking just to cover contractually obligated increases to not pass it is going to mean cuts to programs and staffing and Weathersfield already our per pupil expenditure is well behind other towns um, the Derg average we're well below um, and I think to support the budget would be a benefit to all town residents uh, when there are strong schools families move into town property values go up and economic activity increases it's important that we're providing a rigorous and engaging curriculum for our students and our dedicated teachers need resources. They can't continue to do more with less. We don't want to put them in the position to have to do less with less. Our children deserve more. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tammy Judson. I reside at 114 Highland Street, weather sealed, of course. <laughs> so used to saying it. Um, mine is in relation to a whole group of things I'll put together. Um, Obviously, with the budget and my kids being um, high crest for um, all of their high school, uh, middle school, and elementary career, as well as I'm a returning Weathersfield uh, grad as well myself and grew up here, um, I don't think that the budget should be affected. I think that what Mr. Emma is offering, I think, is fair to say that these teachers um, work hard and do a lot for our children. My um, other concern is, which is very a, a very um, sensitive topic amongst a lot of people, but the bill of HB 5044 and HB 5043, which this bill is in response to the removing religious exemptions within our um, state of Connecticut, which of course is against our constitution and that we are now supportive of 
not supportive, but we are supposed to provide each of our children with education. Separate whether if you are for vaccines or against vaccines. Our schedules of vaccines have tripled over the past 10 years for kids that are born nowadays, which has put our children, children in the EIPs, in issues of chronic diseases in a higher state. I'm also a pediatric nurse. I also fight for these kids every single day in, in support of my own children, being smart about what I choose for my children, which is my choice. When we come to our kids go to school, when our kids go to school, I'm concerned that we'll have a ch chance of something happening with this budget, meaning we either have a group of kids, which there are a lot of people in the woodworks people are not aware of, that maybe don't want to do a sexually transmitted vaccine of HPV for their 10-year-old going to elementary school to be able to go to school, which they are mandating, which is in our bill that's added in there, including a flu vaccine. If we turn and we say to these people, okay, they're going to mandate it, and someone says, no, I don't want to do that, okay, well, you're now going to be forced to homeschool. In Connecticut, we are not homeschooling our children. We're asking for a public education, which now the town would have to take forth that cost of that child being homeschooled or out of a school program, whether if it be a separate program or whatever they choose to do. So in the part of us as a, a public, we have to think in our sense, how will we? I'm a person that pays $18,000 a year in taxes for my house. How will I pay that money? Or how will the, the town pay me back money for my kids not going to school because I may choose not to do a flu vaccine or haven't chose to vaccinate my children. I think this is a subject that goes in a broad range, but it's something that may come around and kind of slap us in the face. Or it could be the influx of homeschoolers that now want to put their, their children into public schools because they now know that religious exemption will go for public school children. That was the addendum on the bill, if anybody's not aware, of K through 12. The addendum is saying that you are now grandfathered in as a, um, as a religious exemption. So I just, I wanna put it to attention that the budget that we are here, it's a fragile thing. And I think that we're looking at a lot more things going on and this being the year of the election, it makes it more volatile for a lot of people. So I just would like to support the budget and just be in mindset and in hindsight, what is coming around the turn that could potentially happen within our town and to protect all of our children. Obviously from every single thing out there from diseases to our health, to our school, but also to their education, which is number one in my books to my kids. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to make public comment? Seeing none, we'll move on to communications. Mr. Emmett. Thank you, Mr. Kerry. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I wanna focus my communication this evening on the uh, ever-changing situation with regard to COVID-19, uh, the coronavirus. This message serves to update you on the current situation regarding the coronavirus outbreak. Since my last communication uh, to the community on Friday evening, the state now reports two confirmed cases within uh, the state. We continue to be in close contact with state and local officials regarding planning and response to the situation. I did participate in a conference call last evening with Governor Lamont as well as state commissioners. Yesterday's meeting featured clear guidance concerning the elimination of large group events beyond 100 participants. This afternoon, Governor Lamont issued a state of emergency. The primary purpose for this declaration is to increase the quantity of available tests in the state of Connecticut. In addition, there were schools in Region 14 that announced closure for the remainder of the week, and there was one specific uh, elementary school in Stratford that has closed. The Weathersfield Public Schools remain open at this time. With the developments over the past 24 hours, we do need to make further adjustments to our day-to-day -day operations. Today, CIAC made the decision to cancel winter sports tournaments. This certainly had an impact on our students at Weathersfield High School. We had multiple teams that were engaged in the tournament. At this point in time, that's been canceled. Uh, out of state trips, uh, I had talked before about the two international trips, one being to <coughs> Ireland and one being to Costa Rica being canceled. We have now moved forward with the cancellation of the DECA trip to Nashville and a softball trip uh, to Orlando. Day trips scheduled for out of state destinations such as New York City have also been canceled after consultation with the Central Connecticut Health District. Let me say that that decision is one of the hardest decisions I have to make because I know the number of people who are impacted. I know the number of seniors that we're looking forward to going on those trips. I know the sacrifice that parents made 
financially to get those kids on those trips. But I have to look at the clear and present issue of this virus and I take my direction from the Central Connecticut Health District as well as state officials. The safety and well-being of our students is of paramount importance. And my concern, although I wanted you to get to go to Costa Rica, I was worried about what would happen if I sent you down there and couldn't get you back because you were quarantined. Those are the realistic pieces that we have to look <coughs> at. They're the what ifs. It's not fear mongering, but it's the reality of where we are right now. I want to talk with you a little bit also about local field trips. Um, what we're trying to do at this point in time is community transmission has started in the state of Connecticut is we're looking to kind of close our circle a little bit. So we are canceling local field trips uh, in the state of Connecticut through April vacation at this point in time. And this is being done to limit students exposure to larger community groups. The WHS spring production is scheduled for this week. I'd like to see it happen. However, we're going to see it happen in a modified fashion and that's going to be a limitation of um, attendees to no more than 100. We're also going to make sure that we are in the process of seating people where there is enough room in between. Uh, we may end up adding additional performances. I have not been in contact with the high school as of uh, this evening to understand that so we'll get that information out as soon as we get it. With regard to the CMEA music event, uh, this is an event that Weathersfield has hosted for the past several years. This brings in over 1,500 people um, to our high school, happening in a couple weeks. Uh, we did make the decision at this point in time to cancel that. Elementary festival rehearsals will go on as scheduled for the time being. Uh, we understand that that's another one of those uh, performances that draws a huge number of people, including many grandparents who are more vulnerable uh, to this virus. With that being said, we're exploring ways to be able to live stream uh, or tape performances so that parents have a memento of uh, that particular uh, concert. We are in the process of working on a plan for virtual schooling. I will be clear that the state was not in favor of districts moving forward with virtual schooling. The state looks at districts to uh, come up with other alternatives such as using emergency days or April vacation as a means of completing the school year. We do have the ability to request a waiver from the state of Connecticut, which we may well do. But I'm not going to submit a waiver until I know we have a clear plan and we have an equitable plan that takes into account all of those students that may or may not have internet access at home. Uh, today I sent out a survey to all parents in the district looking for that information. Um, please, if you're able to respond to that, I'd appreciate that you do so. We also sent out a survey to all staff members um, to look at staff uh, technology capabilities, what they have at home to be able to facilitate virtual schooling. Um, this afternoon, Mrs. DeStoli, Ms. Harris, uh, curriculum specialists sat and met and talked about the process of curricular uh, needs and expectations around virtual schooling. So once we have a, um, a set plan in place, we'll potentially move forward. With regard to makeup days, please note that in the event of closure, the district does have 10 emergency days starting on June 17th through June 30th, as well as five April vacation days to potentially utilize. The state prefers this uh, method and uh, there has been no decision made at this point in time. Uh, and again, I wanna share this with you for planning purposes. Um, those E's on all of those days at the end of June mean emergency. So anybody that's booked a trip, you've done it at your own peril. Um, we'll have more information on our process and where we head um, once we know how long we potentially might need to close. And let's talk about that. There is no clear answer with regard to the length of the time the district may need to close if it needs to close at all. What I want to be clear with is that I will do everything possible to offer the most amount of advanced notice in the event that we must close. I understand that this potentially has a tremendous impact on parents who work and I understand that it has a, a big impact on our staff as well. So we certainly want to get information out to you as soon as we possibly can. As I said in my communication um, last Friday, be prepared. Start planning for alternatives in the event that the district is closed with regard to child care. Um, I have talked um, briefly with Josue Irizarry. He's the director of the Y program. We're looking at how the Y program might operate, if it could operate. Um, within a closure, so I'll have more information with regard to that um, as, as I receive it. 
Um, we're also looking at the potential. In the event that we needed to close, what do I do about my students that need lunch? What do I do about lunch access? At this particular time, Mr. Kazak is working with the um, State Department of Education as well as Chartwells to look at um, guidelines. Mr. Kazaka reports that additional guidelines will be forthcoming from the state uh, this Friday. So we'll have more information and hopefully a plan in place shortly with regard to how to provide lunch for our students and families in need. I also wanna talk with you about student anxiety. Uh, last Friday I sent a communication and I talked about bullying um, and being alert about the fact that um, kids may be a little bit insensitive to others. This has been complete and utter media saturation and changing schedules that we are seeing in our schools definitely may lead to increased anxiety. Do not hesitate, parents, to contact your child's teacher if you see signs of anxiety. The district has resources to assist parents with talking with children about coronavirus. Please visit the educational resources page on our website. We have an excellent link to a program called Brain Pop. Within the health and social emotional learning section, you'll find a link directly related to coronavirus as a means of being able to talk with your students about it. And finally, last but not least, I uh, remain in consultation with town leadership. Um, with the governor's declaration today, a meeting's been set up tomorrow morning at 8.30. Um, I'll be over here at town hall to discuss um, planning with regard to town. I will be with the um, Hartford Area Superintendents Association on Thursday. Uh, talking with my colleagues around what's going on in other districts. Um, I've spoken today with Rocky Hill. We've also had um, communication with Glastonbury uh, via email as well as East Granby and a variety of other districts. Everyone is going through this and everyone is doing the best they can with preparation. Um, and I can't say enough with regard to um, parent feedback. One thing we are looking at doing, I got an email from a, a Emerson parent today about the potential of translation. So we're looking at how we might be able to utilize Google Translate to make sure that we get this important information out in all languages to all our um, families in the community. And with that, that's communications. Thank you. Moving on to recommended motions. Mr. Emmett, your presentation. Yes, sir. Good evening again, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to be with you this evening uh, as I present the superintendent's proposed 2020-2021 uh, budget. Um, this process um, actually is probably the latest I think I've ever presented a budget, but let me be clear in articulating the amount of work that went into this budget. This particular budget document first made its way up onto our website for public consumption back on December 16th. We had a series of budget workshops and a tremendous amount of input from members of the community, many of whom I am thrilled to see here this evening, as well as board members, as well as town council leadership. Thank you for being here tonight, Mr. Mazzarella. Appreciate it. Our budget tells a story, and one of the things I have been always adamant about is making sure that the story is with our students. So the pictures you see, those are our students the fruits of our labor. If you'll notice, our approved 2019-20 budget was $55,759,339. And that was after an adjustment where we took out the operations and maintenance lines. This year, for the proposed 2021 budget, I am proposing a budget of $57,713,537. The amount of that increase, $1,954,198. It is a percentage increase of 3.5%. So I wanna talk with you a little bit about how, how we got here and, and where we were at. We started our work back in December and we came forward with a proposed budget of uh, an increase of 3.66%. We had two drivers that made that budget need to be adjusted. Those drivers were an adjustment to medical dental insurance, health insurance, 
We projected back in December a 10% increase, and right now we are at looking at a 12.5% increase. That was an increase of the budget to uh, a tune of 125,000. In addition to that, we had to add in the WFT degree changes. That's a contractual obligation for our teachers that have um, accrued an additional degree, and that total is 60,000. That results in a total of $185,000 in additions and an increase total of 3.99%. Then what we ended up doing was we looked at some reductions, and we looked at reductions in an area where they didn't hit student programs directly. So for example, we have cut in the area of IT, we've cut $67,000. Is that Chromebooks? No, it's not Chromebooks. It was very clearly articulated uh, by the IT department that the Chromebooks were a necessary tool it wasn't a nice to have, it was a have to have. And as I just mentioned, the potential of virtual schooling, these Chromebooks become more important than ever before. One area that we did reduce, and this one is, is pretty much a no-brainer and we can absolutely take it, and that is the uh, WHS nurse tutor. This is a position at the high school that focuses on a student with special needs. That individual will be aging out of the district, and as such, this position will no longer be required. In addition to that, we have an outplay student that has graduated. This is now also a done deal. So we're looking at a recognized savings of 85,000. That was in next year's budget. It no longer needs to be there. In addition, we're looking at additional choice revenue. One of the things I've worked very hard to do over the past um, year and a half is to increase our open choice enrollment to bring us in some additional revenue. As you recall, uh, I think it's goal three of the strategic plan looking for other ways to raise revenue. Well, that's what we're trying to do there. Um, I'm proud of the uh, partnership we've built with the Open Choice Program, and uh, we have seen our enrollment go up over the past several years, so we're looking for some additional revenue there with um, enrollment increases for next year. And then what we did, um, and I do caution you on this, we reduced instructional supplies by 67,000. We typically um, reduce instructional supplies every year, and that's one of those lines that we typically do not spend out 100%. We're using that money to cover other areas such as special education where the lines are a little more volatile. So where we are right now with the total reductions, we are at $57,713,537. We are looking for a net increase of 3.5% for the 20 21 school year. Again, we always talk each year about the drivers, what drives our budget. Um, I think the, the, we always think that there's fluff and I've got, you know, money out in coffee cans out on Standish Park, buried in the park. And that's not the case. The majority of our budget is driven by contractual increases mandates. So you can see here a breakdown of our WFT contractual salaries and the percentage of the budget. We are a people business. We have all other contractual increases, that is including our uh, parents and secretaries, it's including our administrative group, our nurses. We're looking at all benefits, uh, including a 12.5% increase for health insurance. We had several years where our health insurance uh, increases were very modest. Um, this would make two years in a row where we've seen a pretty significant increase in health insurance. We're also looking at uh, drivers around transportation tuition, net of changes and reductions. We're seeing uh, a 4.23% of our total budget with that. Now you may recall you had a, an action item come before you with regard to the extension of our access transportation contract. Remember the reason that we did that was to align the access transportation contract with our autumn con uh, transportation contract and an effort to go out to bid um, with both uh, five years out and hopefully be able to save money. So when you look at it, salary and benefits account for $1.831 million or 93.71% of the total budget increase. Not, there's not a lot of fat there, folks. Here's the 2021 summary by object. Um, this is consistent with the school districts around the state. The bulk of our budget goes for salaries and benefits. And then we have a section for purchased property services 
supplies, and property. And here's a breakdown, a graphic breakdown of what that budget increase entails. Salaries, benefits, and you can see a decrease in, in property and, and supplies. Part of that is related to the, um, with the lease, with the Chromebooks. And you can see with, uh, again, more drivers. Here's some more specificity here. We're seeing a decrease in the reallocation of tutor hours for certified ELL teachers. That's one thing uh, that we've seen. We haven't seen budget increases uh, for additional staff in recent years. We've reallocated tutor dollars to be able to bring in certified ELL teachers. We have brought in currently four ELL teachers. And we're seeing, as I mentioned at a previous board meeting, 18-19 uh, data showed 337 uh, English language learners in district. That is a population that's growing rapidly. I want to talk a little bit about specialized programs. One of the uh, things that the Board of Education charged me with doing a couple years ago was developing in-district programs with uh, the ability to be able to reduce the reliance upon out-of-district tuitions. So we have two programs in district at this point in time that we have developed. Uh, we have an ABA program that's Applied Behavioral Analysis. That's a program that caters to our students um, who have autism disorder, and uh, it is housed over at Webb. And what we have seen with regard to savings is profound. Between those students that we brought in from out-of-district placements, plus all of the other students that we were able to maintain and did not have to send out. We have a net total savings of $1,342,309. And I've got a group of 18 students that are in their home district, working with their peers and having access to a free and appropriate public education with typical peers. With our STRIVE program, which is housed over at Hammer Elementary School, um, we have seen cost avoidance to the tune of 300000 for all of those students that would have gone out of district if we did not have that program. It's a little more difficult with the STRIVE program to transition students back in, so we haven't seen that happen this year, but we do that on a case-by-case -case basis. So we've seen good savings with these programs. Here are some other... Um, Drivers that we have, they're kind of fixed costs. Uh, other post-employment benefits, the OPEB Trust, we do uh, contribute to the OPEB Trust. So our increase to that is $78,000. We have increases to defined benefit and defined contribution pension plans. Again, you see that total cost of health insurance. And we have Social Security and Medicare increase based on projected staff and salaries of $69,753. With our purchase professional services, one of the things that we see is an increase in required special ed consultation services. One of the pieces with special education is the fact that there are many laws mandating it. So it's not one of those things that we can necessarily say, no, we, we can't do it. Um, we have some obligations that we need to meet within the PPT process as we develop individualized education plans for our students with special needs. Again, the other thing we're looking at is we're projecting an increase in legal services due to pending negotiations. We have three bargaining units that we'll be engaging in negotiations with over the next year. They include the nurses, the administrators, and secretaries and paraprofessionals. And we see a decrease here. I mentioned this earlier with regard to the Chromebook lease. So we do see an increase in contracted IT services uh, for classroom infrastructure. I cannot say enough about our um, IT team in terms of being able to um, pick up some of the installations that we used to have to go out um, to private contractors to do. So whether it be installation of a smart board, um, whether it be installation of a camera for our surveillance system, our IT team is now able to do that. So we're able to save money instead of having to go to an outside contractor. And again, I, I tell the story. This is one of our uh, few remaining computer labs with the one-to-one -one initiative and all of the Chromebooks and iPads we now have in district, these computer labs are becoming a thing of the past. But they're critically important, nonetheless, uh, for our assessments through SBAC. And what you're seeing here is an increase. This is to address the lease for the one-to-ones. I do want to make mention, as I did in one of our previous budget workshops, we had the unfortunate um, 
issue last year of having a uh, cadre of Dell uh, Chromebooks that we were having an issue with overheating. And these were units that were going home with kids. Mm -hmm. And you got to the point where you had to make the decision, do I send these things home with the potential of them overheating and putting families in peril? The idea was no. So we recalled those units and um, ended up having to take units out of second grade classrooms. Um, I did hear about it. The kids were not happy with me for that. But um, this helps to replenish those units that we had to take offline. And you see our contractual increases for in-district transportation services. Uh, you may remember we had a, a transportation company three years ago. It was not meeting our expectations, and we worked with our law firm to exit that particular contract. Um, we have seen good service from Autumn Transportation. I'm proud of the partnership we built with them. They've been great, uh, certainly responsive in terms of the coronavirus and making sure that uh, we have buses that are sanitized. So it's a good um, partnership that we've had. These are contractual increases um, that are part of the contract. And again, we're looking also at increase in tuition for magnet and outplay students. Um, that's one of those wild cards. We don't often know over the course of the summer who may move in, who may move out, or what the PPT process will do in terms of moving kids back. And again, supplies and drivers. This is the one area I caution. This has been an area that we have um, reduced consistently. That includes replacement of textbooks. Uh, that includes uh, classroom supplies. So this is an area we do need to be cautious of. And again, here I mentioned the the one-to-one -one Chromebooks. I do want to make mention of the this particular picture here. That's one of our um, high school football players. Uh, they went down to the elementary school back in October and re read to the kids. And what you see there, there you see classroom supplies. You you see a smart board there in the picture. You see materials, you see things for the kids to learn. Those are the basics. And then I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the budget driving our vision, where we're at. We're looking for students who are curious, emotionally intelligent, and independent. We want our educators to be innovative. We want them to be tenacious, and we want them to be catalysts for learning. We want our family partners to be connected. We want them to be collaborative and working with us and we want them to be constructive. We need our Board of Ed and community partners to be engaged, mentoring, and resourceful. And we need to make sure that we are inclusive, we are committed to lifelong learning for our students and our staff. We're using the knowledge and skills beyond the walls of our schools, and we are personalizing learning for each and, indivi each and every individual student in this great district. Walk you through the timeline quickly. It was a little different this year. Uh, we did the draft budget document, which was available to Board of Ed and Public on December 16th. We conducted three budget workshops on the 18th of January, the 30th of January, and again on February 5th. I am presenting the budget this evening. Uh, pending action by this Board of Education, we will transmit this budget, the Board of Ed approved budget, to Town Council by the 15th of March. Uh, we are slated, Mr. Carey and I, slated to present the budget to Town Council on Monday, March 16th. Uh, we have the town budget hearing scheduled for April 20th right here in Council Chambers at 7 o'clock. And we have Town Council notifying the Board of Ed of budget allocation by, I believe it's May 15th. So with that, any questions you have, any comments you have about the process? Should we, should we put the motion on the table and then have a discussion? Perfectly yeah. fine, sir. Mr. Michaels. Thank you, Mr. Carey. <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion that the Weathersfield Board of Education approve the operating budget for the 2020-21 school year as presented by the administration in the amount of $57,713,537. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Discussion? Seeing no discussion. I think we've had a lot of discussion. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> fine. That, <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. Thank you, sir. You Thank you, Michael.
Can we have the screen down? <laughs> we got one more presentation. <laughs> Moving on to reports and discussion items, Mr. Emmett, instructional technology presentation. Yeah, we, we did a lot of talk over the course of the, the budget process around the technology and what we have in district. And um, I thought it important to talk a little bit about where, where we were at. So um, I'm pleased to have our instructional supervisor for technology, Ms. Sarah Harris, come up and give us a, a brief presentation on where the district's at with our technology. to warm up. So as that's uh, waiting to warm up, uh, so I'm, I'm Sarah Harris. I'm the Instructional Supervisor of Technology. Um, thank you for that introduction, Mr. Emmett. Um, so I'm really excited to be here today to share a little bit about the reality of um, the very exciting things that are happening in our classrooms across the district um, when it comes to instructional technology. So as I know Mr. Emmett has shared um, at previous meetings, a little more than a year ago, um, our department uh, went through a transition um, and had the opportunity to restructure as I came on board um, and had the privilege to work with our IT team in Weathersfield. Um, I came on board with the instructional lens, so looking at technology through the lens of an ed educator. Um, and I think it's important to note as we move forward with, with this presentation, everything you see here would not be possible without the incredible IT team that we have in this district. They have built an infrastructure, a network, and provide us every day with the hardware and the software to make all of this possible. So I think that's inc incredibly important. Um, so I, I had the opportunity to come on with that instructional lens working with um, Jeff Telke and the IT team. Um, and today I'm going to give you a very brief overview of where we were. Uh, what we've done over the last year and our vision of, of where we're headed as a department and a district. There we go. Um, so in uh, spring of last year, just as we were really starting to, to, the, to begin this transition, um, we wanted to reach out to our teachers. So we uh, surveyed all of our uh, certified staff teachers, uh, all of our related services personnel, et cetera, across the district. Um, to talk about what instructional technology looked like in their classrooms and from their lens what was working um, and what they saw as areas for growth. Um, we saw some uh, very specific uh, emerging themes. We saw that our teachers said that, that they were using the technology. We saw I think 94% of our teachers who were using Chromebooks said they were using them nearly every day, which is incredible. We also saw that our teachers said um, that they wanted to learn more so that they knew that, that they were doing great things. They were confident in that, but they recognized there was more they could be doing and they wanted to learn more. Um, and they also said, we know that we have a lot of materials, a lot of resources, a lot of software, but we want to make sure that we all know what we have. So they asked that we put something together so that they had access to those resources. And those were common themes that we saw pre-K through 12. So as a team, we developed a series of action steps. Um, we said we wanted to certainly focus on maintaining and supporting and furthering our one-to-one -one Chromebook initiative in, in grades really 2 through 12, going home in grades 7 through 12. Uh, we said we wanted to focus on developing um, our students' digital citizenship skills, so their ability to interact in a digital world and be respectful and responsible in that community. Um, we said we wanted to focus on making sure that the software and the hardware we have really align with our curricular goals and our, our goals for instruction. And, and perhaps I think the most important, we said we wanted to build really strong partnerships and um, professional relationships with teachers across the district with the IT team and with the instructional technology team. As you uh, move through this presentation, you'll notice that there, there's a common through line here. So our work aligns um, in, in nearly every way with the district's five-year strategic plan. So you'll see that that's a common theme as we move through. So as we look at opportunities for authentic learning, we have Chromebooks. Oops, we go backwards there. Go forward. So we look at opportunities for authentic learning. We have Chromebooks in our classrooms, as I've shared, and those Chromebooks are being used in a wide variety of ways, which I think is perhaps what makes them such exciting tools. They are incredibly versatile. 
what you're seeing on the board is just a snapshot. Uh, that's our seventh graders at Silas Dean Middle School who are using probes in science class. Those probes connect wirelessly with their individual Chromebooks. So the data they're collecting um, can be analyzed right from their Chromebooks in the classroom and outside of the classroom. In our uh, pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade classrooms, we have iPads. Those iPads um, provide touch screens, which are more developmentally appropriate for students, uh, of, for our younger learners. Um, and it also allows for collaborative uh, opportunities. So teachers use those a lot at stations as students are working together on those collaborative opportunities in our pre-K, kindergarten, and first grade classrooms. It does also allow for personalized instruction for those younger learners as well, particularly in the area of literacy and math. One of the things our teachers asked for um, was easy access to what we have. So we have developed, with um, our teachers' support, a library of every resource um, in the Weathersfield Public Schools. And this is a living, breathing page. This is constantly changing, constantly being updated. We have free resources. We have open education resources, which is a focus for us, um, which are low-cost resources uh, created by a variety of organizations. And of course, we have our uh, Weathersfield Public Schools uh, paid subscriptions on here as well. Um, as uh, the Special Services Department and I started to work together last summer, um, we realized that we had some real area for growth um, in the area of assistive technology. So we have, as a Weathersfield Public Schools for many years, worked very hard to provide students um, with specific needs with the technology they need to uh, succeed and to access our curriculum in every possible way. But we recognized that we didn't have a really clear protocol for what that looked like. And we also recognized that that really was happening in sort of silo within um, the Special Services Department and the IT team. And those students are not just in special educators' classrooms. In fact, most of the time, they're in our, our uh, general education classrooms, and they're working with teachers across the district. So we wanted to make sure that we opened assistive technology beyond the special education classroom and made it a priority uh, for all of our teachers. Liz Freitas um, in the Special Services Department and I worked together this summer to uh, build a team. We have a team of 15 uh, educators of all, in all different roles across our district who are now our assistive technology team. We worked with uh, the State Education Resource Center, CERC, this year um, to build capacity within our district and really make sure that we had an understanding of what um, effective implementation of assistive technology looked like. And then we took it a step further. Um, we had the opportunity this fall to apply for um, a federal uh, program um, where an organization called CAST um, was looking for um, districts that were kind of where we were. They were looking to uh, use what they have, and they had a pretty good infrastructure, but were looking to improve how we create inclusive um, technology environments. And we were really excited to share um, that in December we found out we were selected as one of only seven districts in the entire nation. Um, and I know they received many applications, so we were very proud um, to work with uh, this organization through a Department of Educa Federal Department of Education grant um, to improve how we are uh, implementing assistive technology, our protocol, um, and to create a, as they would describe it, an inclusive uh, technology environment within our classroom. So this is very exciting. This is just getting started. Um, and our team is expanding. So we started with 15 educators. We now have more than 25 who are interested in being a part of this process. Um, and, and this is something that we're really looking forward to um, doing in consultation with these other six districts um, across the country. And you can see where they are. We really, we're the only district in the Northeast um, who will be taking part in this program. We're also looking to implement universal tools. So we recognize, and this is something that we've come to recognize through our assistive technology work, that tools that are good for students with specific learning needs can be tools that are good for all of our students. And so if we can put some of these tools, and read and write is a toolbar that fits right nicely into our Google Chrome browser. If we can put some of those tools in the hands of all of our learners, we can remove the barriers uh, for our students with specific needs. And we can also make uh, all of the work that we're doing accessible and more accessible for all of our students. So one of the things we're looking to do is to provide universal tools um, that then will, in the long run, also uh, provide financial savings um, so that we're not providing students with uh, specific needs with a very large number of different applications and software to, to address a wide variety of needs. We're looking to find high impact tools that support all students. Another thing we're working on um, 
is providing our students with uh, access to virtual reality. Um, and Mrs. Granado had the opportunity to join us at Hanmer just a few weeks ago as some of our sixth graders traveled to Egypt. Um, we had the opportunity to have our students use uh, these, what they're called, Google Cardboard uh, virtual reality devices to visit uh, pyramids, to visit Cairo and other uh, modern Egyptian cities, to look at the environments in these places and to think about in an immersive, Im immersive way what it might be like to be a person who was living there 5,000 years ago, what some of the challenges they might have faced. Um, and the students really came up with some of the most fantastic questions. When we talk about inquiry in classrooms, we often talk about how we can help our students to develop better questions and how we can help them to become askers of good questions. Virtual reality, as Mrs. Granado and I saw, did that uh, sort of naturally. The students could not ask enough questions, and they couldn't get the questions on the paper fast enough. Um, so this is something that we've developed. We have a VR mobile lab, um, and we have, in uh, working with the IT team, we've actually been able to recycle uh, our admin phones. So as administrator phones are no longer um, suitable for, for daily use by administrators, they are suitable for this sort of work. So we take them offline, they connect to Wi-Fi, and we're able to recycle. Um, again, this is a high-impact, low-cost initiative. So as we look at um, instruction and assessment of, of skills, in particular digital citizenship skills, we're looking at how we can embed digital citizenship skills into our classrooms. Um, the beginning of this year, all of our second through sixth grade classrooms engaged in a common lesson. Uh, this was a through line across all of our school, our elementary schools. And we also had a separate um, developmentally appropriate lesson that went through social studies classes in seventh and eighth grade. At the end of the elementary lesson, the students developed uh, classroom pledges for what it looked like to be a responsible and respect respectful digital citizen. Um, and they actually shared these, which was, was also really cool in that our students got a chance to see what their classmates, um, grade level and vertical classmates across our five elementary schools had come up with. Um, so it was an opportunity for some sharing and collaborating across our elementary schools. Uh, as we move forward, uh, one of the things we've been working on is creating um, opportunities for teachers to seamlessly embed digital citizenship learning into our classrooms. Um, we are all, as adults, using di uh, digital tools every day in our lives. Some of us are, are using them right now as part of our professional life. So we're working with students not on learning about how to be a good digital citizen outside of the classroom or in a special digital learning time, but rather we're hoping to create authentic opportunities that are just like what all of us are doing in our professional lives. How do we learn to use digital tools in a classroom and manage that um, while still remaining focused and professional? And right in line with that, um, we have begun this year uh, using a Chromebook management platform called Go Guardian in our 6th through 12th grade classrooms. This will be moving to 5th grade in the coming year. Um, this allows our teachers to manage how students are using their devices and really support their growth and development as digital citizens. Um, the, students are, the teachers are able to uh, see what the students are working on. Um, and are able to take corrective measures to support students and redirect behavior that is not productive. Just since we started in May, we have seen a 50% decrease in time spent on YouTube on district Chromebooks, um, which, as we know, there are many wonderful learning tools on YouTube, um, but there are also many uh, not learning focused tools available on YouTube and videos to watch. Um, so so we, do, we do see that as a, as a significant decrease, um, and that's just through since May 2019. Um, we did do a survey uh, early this year as teachers started really piloting it because we were looking at, is this working for you? What is this looking like in classrooms? And 91% of our teacher respondents reported that GoGuardian had been a, a valuable classroom management tool. What you see up there is actually the, um, the platform that we see every day when we look on the district side. So it gives us um, also a glimpse into kind of the big picture. How are our Chromebooks being used in classrooms and helps us to gather some of that data, which I have found incredibly interesting and very useful as we move forward. Um, and this is just some feedback from teachers. Our teachers, particularly um, in grades six, seven, and eight, um, as this was new for them this year, were really excited to see this tool because it helped them to manage um, how they were using Chromebooks in the classroom and make sure that that work was productive and focused on learning. 
Another thing we've been focused on this year um, that I'm, I'm sure has been a focus, I know has been a focus for school districts across Connecticut, uh, is cybersecurity. Um, so our network engineer, Jim DeReagan, and our IT team have been working tirelessly, and I do mean tirelessly, including weekends, to make sure that our school district network is protected and is safe for our students and our faculty. Um, uh, some of you may be aware that this is this has become a real a real concern, um, and it, it's not theoretical at this point. This is something that has impacted uh, districts across the state, including most recently Hamden, Avon, Walcott, and it really has had devastating impacts on those districts to the point of having to turn off internet. It has interrupted not just teaching and learning, but also business. Um, we are, are very lucky to have the team we have who is working night and day to make sure that that our network is protected, our students are protected, um, and that we won't uh, have that sort. Of situation here in Wethersfield. So uh, here in Wethersfield and across the state, um, there has been a focus on what we call digital equity. Um, we've been able to address some of that uh, digital equity by making sure that all of our students in grades 7 through 12 have Chromebooks to take home. But we do recognize that we have families, albeit a, a fairly small number, but we have families that do not have access to internet at home. Uh, something we've been working on in partnership um, with the Wethersfield Youth and Family Services and with um, our early childhood program is how we get the word out about some of these low cost internet options that are available for qualifying Wethersfield families. So that's something we've been working on. Uh, Cox Connect to Compete is one that is available for families um, that provides internet services and also can provide devices, low cost devices for families who do not have a computer in the home and need, would like a family computer. Um, we will continue to work with these organizations as well as other organizations in Wethersfield along with, with specific schools uh, to make sure that this message gets out. So as we sort of reflect on where we are this year, um, I think again it's really important to look at what our teachers um, and our certified staff across the district are saying. Um, our teachers are looking for opportunities to visit classrooms. They know that we have incredibly exciting things happening in classrooms across the district and they want to see what's happening in their colleagues' classrooms. They're looking for opportunities to, to work with us um, in the instructional technology team to plan lessons, to brainstorm. Um, I can tell you some of the most exciting parts of my days are when I get to be in classrooms with teachers planning. I started this morning at 8 a.m. at Hanmer with a teacher who wanted to learn about this platform we have called Google Classroom. And by the end of our time together, she was all excited to share it with her students when they arrived 10 minutes later. Um, that's the kind of teacher we have here in Wethersfield. And we are, I get emails every day from a teacher who heard about something new and wants to implement it. And that's incredibly exciting. So of course here in Wethersfield, not just in the instructional technology department, but across our district, we have a growth mindset. We are always looking to improve. We're proud, very proud of what we've accomplished, um, but we know that we have lots of room for continuous improvement. We're looking to make sure that our, our technology is being used to transform and redefine instruction, um, and in many ways it already is, but that will be a focus for us as we move forward. Of course, our work is always in, aligned with our developing vision of a graduate. And as we move co forward in the uh, coming months and years, as that vision continues to, to be defined, our work will continue to align with those areas of focus. We have developed um, district instructional technology priorities. And, and I think for me, that first goal, uh, fostering a culture of embedded instructional technology to improve student achievement across content areas, that's our focus, that's our work. And in line with that, um, in Lyle Kurtman and, and uh, Michael Fullen's 2016 book, he emphasizes that it's really about pedagogy, it's not about the technology. Technology is wonderful, but only if it changes the way we think of instruction. And that has served as a model, motto for our uh, instructional technology department, and that will continue to define and guide us as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Board members, any questions or comments? I have, I have a, a question, but first I want to comment. That was exciting. That was, and what you've done, too, is very exciting, and the teachers are enthralled having the technology in their classroom. Can you tell me about live binders? 
Absolutely. Okay, I read it and yes. <laughs> so in the interest of time, we were, you know, we, were, we have a lot we were excited about, but we were trying to, to cut that down, which is why that slide's no longer in there. Uh, Live Binders um, is a very low cost platform that has allowed our teachers to work collaboratively on developing curriculum. It is incredibly exciting as we now have teachers across, for example, all third grade classes or all fourth grade classes across our five elementary schools working from shared curriculum documents, collaborating on shared curriculum documents, and having the opportunity to make comments and communicate with each other about that curriculum. Um, this is something that we piloted this year at the elementary level with our uh, new and revised developing curriculum in uh, grades, pre -K, uh, grades K6, science, social studies, math, and ELA. And we look forward to moving that to the middle school and high school as we go forward. Thank you. That's great. Any other questions, Congressman? Mr. Cassio. Thank you. And thank you to the department. Great job. Uh, the enthusiasm is incredible. Um, this couldn't be better to have it in front of us. Um, high impact, low cost. Uh, you are working, um, you're peeling the onion, you know, so to speak, to make things happen in Weathersfield. Um, the Chromebook use uh, is picked up. I know that was one question that came out in our budget, and I think this is a good platform to be able to tell people why every student should be using the Chromebook that's offered to them and not their own personal device. I think that could be very helpful. Um, we had a question at our budget issue there, so. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Um, so really that goes back to uh, the discussion of network security and of cyber security. Um, so as I said, our, our district and our IT department has worked really hard to make sure those Chromebooks um, have the appropriate filtering and software on them um, to prevent those cyber attacks and to protect our network. Um, bringing in outside devices uh, opens up what, what our network engineer, Jim DeReagan, calls threat vectors. Um, and so for every personal device that, that comes into our school buildings, uh, we have a new threat vector. Um, we cannot control uh, what kind of uh, protection software um, or malware software is, is on those devices. Um, and so that does pose threats for us. And we also can't touch personal devices, of course. Um, so, so using district issues Chromebooks has always been important. Today, it's become incredibly important. From a teaching and learning perspective, um, the GoGuardian platform that we have uh, will work on a district-issued device, a Chromebook um, logged into a Google account. Um, and it also, uh, and it, so it allows teachers to monitor and manage Chromebooks in that way as well. Thank you. And Absolutely. then, um, as you can see, our education uh, platform is changing in Weathersfield. Very it's much. not the reading, writing, and arithmetic. We do have the basics, and I know you have a motto. Um, but that is why, that, this is driving our budget as well, you know, to keep us going. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Lesser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, your enthusiasm was outstanding. Thank you to you and Jeff and all you guys are doing in the IT department. It's, it's, it's really great for our kids and um, uh, enthusiasm is contagious and I hope that uh, spreads to everyone. Certainly seems like it spreads to your department and the teachers. I have two questions, two quick questions. Yeah. First, we have, um, I think the last count is 44 different languages spoken yes. in our Weathersfield schools. And I want to see if you can comment of how uh, you kind of are using the technology to help teach those who English is not their first language. And the second question is regarding, uh, you had a lot of feedback you talked about, uh, teacher feedback and working with teachers. I wonder if you are able to, or perhaps in the future, get some student feedback uh, and maybe have a leadership opportunity for some students, perhaps of the upper grades, to be involved in some of the planning, some of the ideas, because as you know, some of our young people know a lot more, I'll speak for myself, Absolutely. my kids know a lot more about technology than I do, but so those two things about the language and then student, student feedback. Absolutely. So I'll speak to the student feedback first. Um, so we did collect student feedback as well, again, in the interest of keeping the presentation Understood. short. Um, I can certainly share some of that student feedback. So we collected feedback from our 7 through 12 students last spring at the same time we collected it from teachers. Um, as far as leadership opportunities, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think our students are an incredible resource, um, and that is a focus for our department going forward. Um, when we started working on our website development this fall, uh, we went into an e-commerce class, um, and we had a group of students who were really interested in providing us some feedback on the website, looking at it through a lens that really could be an authentic professional lens for students interested in web design. Um, and we are interested in continuing to harness that excitement from those students because they'd like to continue working with us. So that will be a, an initiative going forward. Um, as far as the English language 
English learners, absolutely. Um, we, so we do have, as you said, 44 languages spoken across our district. Um, and we have a number of different um, software specifically f uh, for our English language learner students. Um, we are using those softwares through our L teachers as well as through some of our general education classes. Um, as far as engaging those families, uh, so just, just this morning actually, I was at the Weathersfield Family Learning, um, working with uh, English language learner uh, families and parents um, as well as their, their children were in a, in a um, uh, preschool opportunity at the time. Um, and what we did was we looked at Google applications, um, specifically Google Translate, and we're working with families to uh, engage those families in how they can use Google Translate to translate any material sent home. Um, so we certainly would like to provide uh, translated materials for families, but with 44 languages spoken, um, Google Translate can be an incredible resource. So Mr. Emmett and I were just talking about sending out um, some information to families on how to use Google Translate, the Google extension specifically, um, to translate any web page or communication sent home to families. Um, that can also be something that is uh, downloaded onto a smartphone, and so some of the families we worked with this morning were actually looking at how they could use um, their the Google Translate app to hold the phone over a communication communication sent home from Mr. Emmett specifically we were looking at and right on the phone it translates everything he's written into a language um, that is specific to them. Great. Thank you and great job. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I just want to say that that quote you ended with is phenomenal and I think as I looked at your initiatives and your enthusiasm you, you can see that you're trying to change pedagogy and not just put technology in the classroom and I think that's great and I think that's one of the reasons why I want this presentation so the public is aware that it's not just Chromebooks in the classroom, that they're being used as cur to Absolutely. access curriculum for mm -hmm. all learners. Mm -hmm. and it's important that we uh, educate everybody on that, the importance of it. As I well. appreciate that. Right, it's, it's about the instruction. And yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Great. Moving on to announcements and information. Board members, check your packet. Look for committee meetings if there's none scheduled make sure we are scheduling them and if you're not able to make one that is scheduled please let the chair know as soon as possible meetings held students programs and services on 22620 mr healy We had a b nice presentation on the profile of the graduate. We went into great detail about uh, how we evaluate, you know, the complete, I guess, the holistic approach to instruction. I thought it was pretty helpful. Uh, other board members were there as well. They were part of it. I don't know if uh, Mr. Emmett has anything he wants to add to that. Yeah, this uh, particular meeting really um, provided the opportunity for our leadership at Weathersfield High School um, to get feedback from Board of Ed members. Um, for those of you who were not um, at that particular meeting, uh, Shannon Belanger and Kristen Musinskis provided that presentation and Shannon did send to the board um, information uh, for further feedback. So if you were not able to attend that meeting, we certainly would welcome your feedback. Um, this is a process that's gonna be going on um, as we prepare for our NEASC decennial visit coming up in two years. Thank you. Weathersfield Early Childhood Collaborative, the WEC, on 3920, Ms. Granado. Okay, well, WEC, which is Weathersfield's Early Childhood Collaborative, met on Monday. Um, the mission of WEC is that all Weathersfield children, birth to eight, are healthy, developmentally successful learners and connected to the community. The meeting began with Kim Bobbin, who is the WEC coordinator, discussing her visit and work with the Weathersfield High School English class on the cultural change in America. Kim informed the students that there had been a 63% increase in our K through six ELL learners in the last four years. So she gave them the assignment, the high school class, the assignment to write welcome letters to the ELL adult ed class to welcome them and they actually, the, the students were fabulous. Kim couldn't stop um, giving praise to them. Kim noted that it was done with great enthusiasm and skill, and many of the letters were done in a foreign language with a, no, a sticky note on top of it saying what adult to give it to. So it was such a successful meeting for Kim. I'm sure she's going to be doing it again. WEC has also recently received two grants the first from the State Office of Early Childhood for $19,000 for their website 
and to continue elaborating on their website and for introductory baby bags for an introduction to every new citizen that we get out of the town hall. Um, also, Liberty Bank is grant funding our transition to K class that meets for two weeks in the summer for our incoming kindergartners who have not had any experience with school. Uh, Community Messengers is funded by the United Way and is set to begin next month. WEC is organizing this initiative. Community Messenger is a group of volunteers who will be versed in all the services that our town offers and will be working to communicate these services to all our town's people. Um, and WEC is looking for opportunities to organize prof professional development for our preschool teachers. This may be done with help from an early childhood consultant consulting partnership funded by the Connecticut Department of Children and Families. And last, we heard from Kanisha Keery from the Beacon Health Options on their work to help children and families. WEC will be looking to see how Wethersfield can work with this organization. Thank you, Ms. Granato. Meeting scheduled, we have the Memorial Day Parade Committee meeting on 311-20 at 7.15. Student Programs and Services on 317-20 at 6.30 p.m. The Correct Council meeting, 318-20 at 11.30 a.m. And Finance and Operations Committee meeting, 324-20 at 6 p.m. There is no unfinished business. Moving on to public comment. Anyone in the public wishing to make comment? Please come to the podium, state your name and address. Suzanne Barton, 55 Main Street. I wanted to thank everyone on the board for approving the budget and sending forward to town council as it is. I know you were under a lot of pressure to try to get that number a lot lower and I appreciate you standing up for education in the, sit in the town um, and we will continue to stand up at town council and ensure that they also hear our voice and we will all be at town council with you to support education in Wethersfield. Thank you. Hi, my name's um, Nicole Teddy. I live on 22 Churchill Street, and um, I'm a student currently at CCSU, and hearing about all the, you know, the steps taken for the whole outbreak of the coronavirus, it's really reassuring because I know a lot of classmates who are like, oh no, what's gonna happen to like our school days, and are we gonna, tra I know like right now it's going everywhere that we're gonna transition to online classrooms now, and it's, it's really scary, I guess, when you don't really know like what's happening. So hearing that like, you know, we're gonna get a lot of like early warning and you're, you guys are on top of it, it's really reassuring and you know, it makes me and I'm sure a lot of other people like really happy to know that like it's being taken care of. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Iman, I just wanted to address something you had brought up. Um, Although we are saying that we're conjugating children less than 100 people. Or we have your name for, and address oh, for sorry, the record. Oh, sorry, Tammy Judson, I'm sorry. 114 Highland. Thank you. Um, conjugating for like the plays or whatever under 100 people. Are there steps to this? Are we gonna like, I know like now going to like Sam's or Costco, like at least when I was just in Florida yesterday, they were handing out white piece to everybody just to wipe their hands down before and after they walked in and out. I'm just thinking, because we have 1,200 kids in a school at once. So in the same concept of having 100 kids down at once, are we saying that over that is not safe? Or are we saying that under that is? Because there's a 14-day incubation period. So I think in the, the realm of 100 people, we're not saying we're in a safe zone or not. Yeah, I feel like it's whatever it is, it is. But are we taking steps to saying, hey, let's, you know, can anybody donate hand sanitizer? If you can find any, from what I heard, there's nothing around. But if people can get those, if that's the case. Hey, typically, we don't engage with public comment and respond during public comment, but Mr. Carey has um, given me the opportunity to do oh, so. Oh, sorry, okay. So, <laughs> not a problem. No, it's, it's certainly an important question. One of the things I said on Friday was the, um, the preventative measures, and those preventative measures continue to be in place. That means frequent hand washing. 
Uh, we've gone through with kids um, how we wash hands. We wash hands for 20 seconds. We may sing happy birthday twice. We have a large amount at this point, at this point in time of hand sanitizer. The town also has the capability of being able to make hand sanitizer for the units outside, the automatic units. Uh, Mr. Shoning from the uh, Fiscal Services Department will be getting another shipment of um, hand sanitizer in this week. So we are pushing very heavily the preventative okay. measures. One of the other things we're looking at doing is typically cafeterias are another area where you see a congregation of kids. So we're looking at adjusting schedules at the elementary level. We had this conversation among the administrative team on Friday morning about the potential of needing to alter schedules a little bit to be able to reduce the amount of uh, the number of kids that are in a cafeteria at, at one given time. I do want to stress that the 100, it's not a magic number. <laughs> it's a number that the state came forward with. So we want to make sure that we're continuing to um, enact appropriate preventative measures, making sure we have the hand sanitizer. Again, I have to reiterate, I said on Friday, if your child is sick, please stay home. Please keep your child home. I met with nurses last Wednesday. That is one thing that they really, really stressed. Uh, and that same holds true for staff. You know, I often talk about the fact in 11 years in this district, I've missed a day and a half due to illness. I, I wear it as a badge of honor, but I'm going to say if I end up having symptoms, I'm staying home because I don't want to infect others, and we need to take that track. So thank you for your comments. Appreciate that. Yes, and the other thing was the June, I, I missed the point which you can't answer to me, but I will bring it up. The June 17th to 30th, if we're in a state of emergency, are those days still used? Or is it that something that you're saying shell off? The reason I'm bringing it up is for exactly like Isaac, who is part of like my daughter, part of a group to go on that Costa Rica trip, which is towards the you know middle to the end of April. And they had an alternative date. Mm -hmm. And those alternative dates, although we all got insurance, it doesn't apply to us anymore. Right. We lose our money. The alternative date was that June 17th to those dates. So just in the realm of that, does that affect it in the sense you're saying, tell anybody if they're not taking vacation that day, Will that be now taken away again? We'll, we'll have a conversation with the um, coordinators of the trip. You know, the other piece that we have to look at, too, for those seniors that are going, is that an opportunity where I can engage the virtual learning? It's right. certainly a potential because all of our seniors have those Chromebooks. So there'll be more to come, and it's going to be interesting to see now that the state has come up with the state of emergency as to whether or not our tour companies, EF Tours, um, is going to be a little more flexible. I do know that there are some... Uh, districts that have canceled trips and please let me tell you most if not all other districts have canceled international trips mm -hmm. um, we've had some tour companies that have been really recalcitrant about wanting to refund anything so our certainly our company EF tours is, is working with us so we'll have more conversation with regard to that uh, again we've made no decision as to whether or not we're going to actually extend out beyond June 16th at this point in time but I did want to make that uh, clear that that's a potential <laughs> So yeah. thanks for that. It's because one of those things like we've had so much more flu than we've had this. It's kind of mm -hmm. like, whoa, mm -hmm. our kids are scared, you know, getting feeling in school. They're getting that that nervousness of school because it's so much hype right now. So mm -hmm. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to make a comment? Hi, Beth Riley, 12 Hubbard Place. I'll be really quick. Thank you guys uh, for your vote tonight. Uh, thank you for your continued service. Um, to the audience members, thanks so much for showing up here tonight. I think it's really important for all of us to attend the upcoming town council meetings to make sure the town council hears from you about your support of this budget. Uh, the next town council meeting is this coming Monday, March 16th at 7 p.m. in this building. Uh, make your voice heard. Um, although I'm definitely in support of passing this budget, I thank all of you. Um, I do want to say that I hope in future years and future budgets um, we can get even uh, not just a status quo budget. I want some more programs here. I'd like a more robust uh, foreign language department. Um, I'd like standard honors AP classes at the high school level. Um, I think it's important that we're keeping up with our surrounding towns, and I don't think we are right now. Um, so just hoping to see that. Anyone else? Seeing none, we'll move on to board comment. Board members. Ms. Granato. 
Well, I, this is a perfect segue to come after, too. I'm, I'm so pleased that our board came together um, in supporting this budget and that we were unanimous in our vote. And I'm also very pleased with all the parents that have come out and supported our schools. But I must remind you that we need to continue to hear your strong voices as it regards the next step in the process, which is the town council's review of this budget. Now, over the years, I've heard loud and clear from parents asking the question, why do we always just limit our budget to a modest increase, if we can even do that? Um, and we never seem to grow the budget in other ways. And I don't know what the answer is to this, why Weathersfield in the past multiple years um, has really been very against our board budget. But I will say we need to cherish our school system. I find it incredibly valuable. And I don't have any children in the school system. Um, I pay heavy taxes like everybody else does. But we owe our kids better. And I know we can do better for them. Each year, the school budget should show at least a modest increase. And this is beyond the things we can't control, because those increases would be for the kids. So I leave you with this closing thought of mine. Our children are our future. I've said it many times in many places. And if you think education is expensive, you should try ignorance. And I also want to say, last thing I want to say is happy anniversary. 200, 2020 marks the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, guaranteeing and protecting the constitutional rights of women to vote. So happy anniversary. Thank you, Mr. Healy. Uh, yes, thank you. A um, Couple things on the budget, you know, I've heard the comments made about how we should be investing, and I perfectly agree that I think if we all had our druthers, we'd, we'd like to spend more money. Um, but the relate, the, the sort of facts of the situation are the economy is a, is a driving factor in all these decisions, and if the economy is roaring and our property values are higher and our assessments are higher, that certainly gives us a chance to do more with the budget. When that turns around, I think you'll see some of the things that Mrs. Granado alluded to. On the same token, we do have people here uh, who do pay taxes, and whether they have children or not in the school system, I do believe it is an asset to the town to have a good school system that's it's operational and vibrant and challenging. I think we have that. Can we do better? Of course we can. Uh, that's why we're here to try to do the best we can with what we have. The second matter, I just wanted to compliment uh, Mr. Emmett, the staff here, the teachers, and I know the parents uh, and the students in the coming uh, weeks ahead. Uh, this is a, you know, obviously an unsettling time and it's a scary time, but we don't need to be paralyzed by it. Uh, my, only op my only thought is that I think uh, we've taken the steps to ensure the safety of all the people that inhabit our schools, the, the students, the teachers, the parents, the volunteers, the paraprofessionals, the staff. Uh, that's our number one goal, obviously. It's our number one challenge. But I think uh, it's really important that parents understand that the communication with the school district is really important. <coughs> Uh, about especially about the, how their children are doing uh, physically and medically uh, and to be patient uh, to be patient this is uncharted territory uh, at least in my mm. lifetime mm. Uh, what we're facing it may not be a big deal it may blow out after a couple of weeks we just don't know and I think that's what's causing everyone's great duress we just don't know so the best we can do each day is get up every day and be prepared and then some I think we're on our way but certainly anyone has any suggestions out there how we can do a better job, I'm sure we're more than eager to hear them and to communicate about uh, where we are as a, on a day-to-day -day basis. So with that, I uh, just wanna pass those compliments along to the people that have been working furiously over the last 24 to 48 hours. Thank you, Mr. Lesser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have comments along the uh, line of uh, Vice Chairman Healy. Um, I have two children in the high school, and they're both a little uh, panicked about uh, what's been happening in the news and the virus. And the kids get this news all day long, mostly on their phone, but also from other kids. And I think, you know, I want to give credit to the superintendent and to all the staff uh, for what they're doing related to the virus. But also, I think the two messages are 
be prepared, but, but stay calm at the same time. And I think we have to tell our children that. I know I'm doing that with my wife in my house, and I think it's important for all of us to try and you know be prepared, be honest, communicate, but also to be calm, because there is a lot of fear and anxiety spreading among, among the kids. So I think that's really important. And as it relates to, to the budget, I want to thank the parents. We, we hear you. We appreciate that you're coming out. And this is the most important thing we do. The budget is a statement of our priorities. And the school budget and the school system is a gateway to our community. And many families, many parents uh, make a choice to live in Weathersfield, or any town for that matter, based on the quality of the school system. And I would say we have a really good school system. We could be better. But how we fund it has a lot to do with our commitment and how our, our education system is. And it's really important. It's been said many times, but I'll echo it to get to the next body, being the town council, over the next uh, few weeks to a month and a half, uh, and let your voices be heard. I know I'll be lobbying, and I, I, I know many of you will be there too, but it's critically important for our town. So again, thank you to superintendent and for the entire staff for the work on the budget and the virus, and um, thank you to, to the parents. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Michaels. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as chair of the Finance Committee, I just wanted to send a big thank you to first the other board members here, but also to the administrative teams at the schools, uh, to the central office team, and Matt, who uh, plays a critical role in, in the budget season, um, coming forward with the answers to the questions we had this year. Um, not always easy questions to ask, not always answers we want to hear, but I appreciate um, the honesty and openness in those, in those answers. And to the parents uh, who came out to our three workshops um, and listened and engaged um, in those. I would just, as everyone else has said, remind you that while we have approved it here at this body, it is by no means the end of the, of the road. Um, so I would also encourage you to stay vigilant and continue to make your voice heard. And perhaps we don't find ourselves back here in a couple of weeks. Um, so please remain engaged, um, and if I could, remain engaged not only during the budget time, but we, we love when there's people out there during all of our meetings, so stay engaged the whole year. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to make comments? Yes, Mr. Riley. I'd like to uh, thank uh, the board for uh, my education in this process. This is the first uh, budget I've been through so it was uh, a lot to take in. I appreciate all the comments that the public made and all the workshops that were, were attended. And you know, I'm not sure what the answer is. I mean, I have a special needs son and it would be great to have a, a science uh, or additional teacher uh, in the high school uh, for him uh, when he gets there. Uh, also, um, when I was campaigning, I heard many folks uh, you know, talk about the property taxes and that they're too high and that they're wanting to move. So I'm not sure what the, uh, what the answer is. Um, and, and I know as far as um, the teachers, they do a fantastic job. My wife is a teacher and I think her situation is, is the same here. She's trying to do more with less. And so uh, it's, it's tough, but thank, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Cassio. Thank you, Chuck. Um, I think the most important part is stay engaged. Stay involved. It's not over. It's like a virus. We are, oh. you know, <laughs> we are, uh, I, I don't think that um, this is great that we ended up uh, having a budget unanimously pass at 3.5%. I think it's uh, a, a, a great idea. But I'm hopeful that it's going to stay here. But, you know, just be prepared. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Isaac, do you have anything? Yeah. I'm not putting you on the spot. I usually have something. So yeah. you're, you're Good evening at WHS. Students are upset for a couple reasons. The Costa Rica trip and Ireland trip have been canceled due to the coronavirus outbreak. Plans are being made to reschedule this trip for a new date, potentially in the summer. But we, as a school, understand that it was for our safety and that if something was to happen when we were on the trip, we wouldn't, you, the superintendent, wouldn't know how to react in that way. 
We are also upset to hear that the CIAC has canceled all sports tournaments with having multiple teams at the playoffs, hockey, girls basketball, and boys basketball. It's affected the school as a whole as well. Uh, the Adams Family Play is, is set to perform Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, while the eighth graders from the middle school are coming to visit this week to see, them, to see the play for themselves. And they're, they're, they're saying yeah, they got canceled, that's, Isaac. That's canceled. That's canceled. Oh, that's, oh. It's 300 eighth graders at oh. one time. They yeah. make it work. They hear about that. That's all. Thank you, Isaac. <laughs> Awkward. Thank you all for coming. I do enjoy that we have so much public participation in this budget process. That's one of my goals, was to make sure it was transparent and uh, hold us accountable. And that's why from the day I was elected four months ago, the budget was the first thing on my mind. And to get it posted three months ago, as Mr. Emmett said, and to get people publicly interested in participating was what my goal was. And so I achieved that goal and I think it's great and I appreciate all the feedback and I Hope we continue to hear feedback on other issues and concerns as they come up. On a different note, I went to STEAM night last week at the community center and it was amazing. My kids had a great time. I wanna thank the teachers who put it on. It is voluntarily done by our teachers over two nights for the five elementary schools. They're engaging activities. Teachers are there, the, some of the administration was there engaging the, student, the students and it was a great community event to look at science, technology, engineering and math. Seeing no other comments, can I have a motion? Oh, he beat me to a motion to adjourn. Mr. Healy, second, anyone? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, motion passes.